Chapter 40 of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 40. We was feeling pretty good after breakfast, and took my canoe and went over the river a fishing with a lunch and had a good time and took a look at the raft and found her all right and got home late to supper and found them in such a sweat and worry they didn't know which end they were standing on and made us go right off to bed the minute we was done supper and wouldn't tell us what the trouble was and never let on a word about the new letter but didn't need to because we knowed as much about it as anybody did and as soon as we was half upstairs and her back was turned we slid for the cellar cupboard and loaded up a good lunch and took it up to our room and went to bed and got up about half past eleven and Tom put on Aunt Sally's dress that he stole, and was going to start with the lunch, but says, Where's the butter? I laid out a hunk of it, I says, on a piece of corn pone. Well, you left it laid out then. It ain't here. We can get along without it, I says. We can get along with it too, he says. Just you slide down cellar and fetch it, and then mosey right down the lightning rod and come along. I'll go and stuff the straw into James' clothes to represent his mother in the skies, and be ready to bar like a sheep and shove as soon as you get there. So out he went, and down cellar went I. The hunk of butter big as a person's fist was where i had left it so i took up the slab of corn pawn with it on and blowed out my light and started upstairs very stealthy and got up to the main floor all right but here comes aunt sally with a candle and i clapped the truck in my hat and clapped my hat on my head and the next second she see me, and she says, You been down cellar? Yes, ma'am. What you been doing down there? Nothing. Nothing? No, ma'am. Well, then, what possessed you to go down there this time of night? I don't know, ma'am. You don't know? Don't answer me that way. Tom. I want to know what you've been doing down there. I ain't been doing a single thing, Aunt Sally. I hope to gracious if I have. I reckoned she would let me go now. And as a general thing, she would. But I suppose there were so many strange things going on she was just in a sweat about every little thing that weren't yet strict straight. So she says, very decided you just march into that setting room and stay there till i come you've been up to something you know business to and i lay i'll find out what it is before i'm done with you so she went away as i opened the door and walked into the setting room my but there was a crowd there fifteen farmers and every one of them had a gun I was most powerful sick and slunk to a chair and sat down. They were sitting around, some of them talking a little, in a low voice, and all of them fidgety and uneasy, but trying to look like they weren't. But I knowed they was, because they was always taking off their hats and putting them on, and scratching their heads 
and changing their seats and fumbling with their buttons. I weren't easy myself, but I didn't take my hat off all the same. I did wish Aunt Sally would come and get done with me and lick me if she wanted to and let me get away and tell Tom how we'd overdone this thing and what a thundering honest nest we'd got ourselves into so we could stop fooling around straight off and clear out with Jim before these ribs got out of patience and come for us. At last she come and begun to ask me questions but I couldn't answer them straight. I didn't know which end of me was up because these men was in such a fidget now that some was wanting to start right now and lay for them desperados and saying it weren't but a few minutes to midnight and others was trying to get them to hold on and wait for the ship signal and here was aunt pegging away at the questions and me are shaking all over and ready to sink down in my tracks I was that scared and the place getting hotter and hotter and the butter beginning to melt and run down my neck and behind my ears and pretty soon when one of them says I'm for going and getting in the cabin first and right now and catching them when they come I most dropped and a streak of butter come a trickling down my forehead and Aunt Sally she see it and turns white as a sheet and says for the land's sake what is the matter with the child he's caught the brain fever as sure as you're born and they're oozing out and everybody runs to see and she snatches off my heart and out comes the bread and what was left of the butter and she grabbed me and hugged me and says oh what a turn you did give me and how glad and grateful I am it ain't no worse for locks against us and it never rains but it pours and when I see that truck I thought we'd lost you for I knowed by the color and all it was just like your brains would be if dear dear why wouldn't you tell me that was what you'd been down there for I wouldn't have cared now clear out to bed and don't let me see no more of you till morning I was upstairs in a second and down the lightning rod in another one and shining through the dark for the lean-to. I couldn't hardly get my words out. I was so anxious. But I told Tom as quick as I could we must jump for it now and not a minute to lose. The house full of men yonder with guns his eyes just blazed and he says no is that so ain't it bully why hawk if it was to do over again i bet i could fetch two hundred if we could put it off till hurry hurry i says where's jim right at your elbow if you reach out your arm you can touch him He's dressed and everything's ready. Now we'll slide out and give the ship signal. But then we heard the tramp of men coming to the door and heard them begin to fumble with the padlock and heard a man say, I told you we'd be too soon. They haven't come. The door is locked. Here, I'll lock some of you into the cabin and you lay for em in the dark and kill em when they come and the rest scatter around a piece and listen if you can hear them coming so in they come but couldn't see us in the dark 
and must trod on us whilst we was hustling to get under the bed. But we got under all right, and out through the hole, swift but soft. Jim first, me next, and Tom last, which was according to Tom's orders. Now we was in the lean-to, and had trampings close by outside. So we crept to the door, and Tom stopped us there, and put his eye to the crack, but couldn't make out nothing. It was so dark, and whispered and said he would listen for the steps to get further, and when he nudged us, Jim must glide out first, and him last. So he set his ear to the crack, and listened, and listened, and listened, and the steps are scraping around out there all the time. And at last he nudged us, and we slid out, and stooped down, not breathing, and not making the least noise, and slipped stealthy towards the fence in injun file, and got to it all right and me and Jim over it. But Tom's breeches catched fast on a splinter on the top rail, and then he heard the steps coming. So he had to pull loose, which snapped the splinter, and made a noise. And as he dropped in her tracks and started, somebody sings out, Who's that? Answer, or I'll shoot. But we didn't answer. We just unfurled our heels and shoved. Then there was a rush and a bang, 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 and the bullets fairly whizzed around us. We heard them sing out. Here they are. They've broke for the river. After them, boys, and turn loose the dogs. So here they come full tilt. We could hear them because they, were, they wore boots and yelled, but we didn't wear no boots and didn't yell. We was in the path to the mill, and when they got pretty close onto us, we dodged into the bush and let them go by, and then dropped in behind them. They'd had all the dogs shut up, so they wouldn't scare off the robbers. But by this time, somebody had let them loose, and here they come, making power wow enough for a million. But they was our dogs, so we stopped in our tracks till they catched up, and when they see it wasn't nobody but us, and no excitement to offer them, they only just said howdy, and tore right ahead towards the shouting and clattering. And then we up steam again, and whizzed along after them till we was nearly to the mill, and then struck up through the bush to where my canoe was tied, and hopped in, and pulled for dear life towards the middle of the river, but didn't make no more noise than we was obliged to. Then we struck out, easy and comfortable, for the island where my raft was, and we could hear them yelling and barking at each other all up and down the bank, till we were so far away, the sounds got dim and died out. And when we stepped onto the raft, I says, Now, old Jim, you're a free man again and I bet you won't ever be a slave no more. And a mighty good job it was too, Hawk. It was planned beautiful, and it was done beautiful, and there ain't nobody can get up a plan that's more mixed up and splendid than what that one was. We was all glad, as we could be, but Tom was the gladdest of all because he had a bullet in the calf of his leg. When me and Jim heard that, 
we didn't feel so brash as what we did before. It was hurting him considerable and bleeding. So we laid him in the wigwam and tore up one of the duke's shirts for to bandage him. But he says, Give me the rags. I can do it myself. Don't stop now. Don't fool around here. And the evasion booming along so handsome. Man the sweeps and set her loose. Boys, we done it elegant. Did we did. I wish we'd a had the handling of Louis. There wouldn't have been no son of St. Louis ascend to heaven, wrote down in his biography. No, sir. We'd a whooped him over the border. That's what we'd a done with him, and done it just as slick as nothing at all, too. Man the sweeps, man the sweeps. But me and Jim was consulting and thinking. And after we'd thought a minute, I says, Say it, Jim. So he says, Well, then, this is the way it looked to me, Hawk. If it was him that us being shot free, and one of the boys was to get shot, would he say, Go on and save me? Meaning me about a doctor fry to save this one? Is that like Mars Tom Sawyer? Would he say that? You bet he wouldn't. Well then, is Jim going to say it? No, sir. I don't budge a step out on this place about a doctor. Not if it's forty year. I knowed he was white inside, and I reckoned he would say what he did say. So it was all right now, and I told Tom I was a going for a doctor. He raised considerable row about it, but me and Jim stuck to it and wouldn't budge. So he was for crawling out and setting the raft loose himself but we wouldn't let him. Then he gave us a piece of his mind, but it didn't do no good. So when he sees me getting the canoe ready, he says, Well then, if you're bound to go, I'll tell you the way to do when you get to the village. Shut the door and blindfold the doctor tight and fast and make him swear to be silent as the grave, and put a purse full of gold in his hand, and then take and lead him all around the black, the back alleys, and everywhere else in the dark, and then fetch him here in the canoe, in a roundabout way amongst the islands, and search him and take his chalk away from him, and don't give it back to him till you get him back to the village, or else he will chuck this raft so he can find it again. It's the way they all do. So I said I would, and left. And Jim was to hide in the woods when he see the doctor coming, till he was gone again. End of chapter 40